Hello, everyone. I'm speaking with Greg tonight. He is the RV carnivore, and he is a carnivore. Greg, so uh, you started carnivore, correct? <laughs> yes, Ali, I, I, <laughs> I did. I um, did. Four years ago, I started oh. carnivore. Oh, wow. Yeah, awesome. yeah, it was a long time ago, and I was, uh, I was very hardcore carnivore for almost three months. Oh, wow. And um, you stopped. Was Did you stop because you almost died? I woke up the next morning and I realized that I was probably very ambiguous about the cause of my stroke. And I want to be very clear about this. We are confident that it was the carnivore lifestyle that saved my life at the time of the stroke. Because again, this is a stroke that people don't survive. Um, it also affects most people over the age of 70 to have a brainstem stroke. So it was a very rare event. And again, this was not during times of COVID, so we can't blame anything on a vaccine because I never took a vaccine to begin with, still haven't had one. And I also want to clarify that I was supposed to be going on a mission trip with my church on the Wednesday following the Monday morning of my stroke. Um, I had gone to the doctor on the Sunday before and was prescribed methylprednisolone steroid for what we thought was a sinus congestion event. And that was supposed to dry me out before I got on this trip, got on, you know, got on a plane and went on this trip to the Bahamas for Hurricane Dorian survivors. And so the only thing we can think is that 15 hours after taking my first doses of methylprednisolone steroid is when I suffered the stroke. I had had some symptoms leading up to that, but I didn't know that there were symptoms of a potential stroke. And when you hear the things that people talk about where you got palsy, where you um, you might stumble your words, you might seem really incoherent. I didn't have any of that. The only things that I had leading up to this were severe um, vertigo. So not just being dizzy, but true vertigo where I actually had to hold myself up against the wall a couple of times um, in a couple of weeks leading up to it. And I also had floaters in my eyes, which are indicative of what they say is a uh, oral migraine, A-U-R-A-L migraine. So anyways, without further ado, back to the discussion. I just wanted to clarify that point because I think it's vital for people to understand this is not a moment of somebody having um, a stroke because of the carnival lifestyle. In fact, uh, it is what saved me in, in our best opinion. Peace. Yes. Can you tell me why you almost died? That's yes. I, and I'll lead up to it very quickly. I was in the worst shape of my life when I turned 40. And when I turned, and when I turned 47, I realized I needed to make a change. So I started running and I was a marathon runner, a crossfitter three days a week, three days a week, surfer, boater. If it was water, I was in it. And uh, I really didn't like CrossFit. I didn't like working out like most people. I did not want to be in the gym. And uh, I found myself feeling like I needed to. And I did that. And I tore my gastric muscle on my right leg. So it's a, to anybody who doesn't really understand what that is, it is an um, injury when you're not stretched. And I had taken a short break from running. I decided to sprint against my daughter on the beach. And I lost because I tore my gastroc. That's like snipping your Achilles heel. And wow. for anybody who's ever done that, it sidelines you. So I was sidelined. Gained about 30 to 40 pounds, so I couldn't eat 10,000 calories a day and lose two pounds overnight. That really did happen. And I turned to my mother-in-law, who suggested that maybe I need to try the carnivore lifestyle. And please understand, I don't like using the D word because it's a ugly sure. word. Yeah, and everybody right. associates that with negative. Mm -hmm. And so I started the carnivore lifestyle and I really got into it because this guy right here loves beef. I <laughs> love ribeyes. Oh, well, yeah, I think I could do that. Had no idea who Ken Berry was at the time. Didn't know Dr. Kiltz. Didn't know Robert, uh, Dr. Boz. Didn't know any of anybody in the space. I was yeah. just following my mother-in-law's um, words. And a little over two and a half months into it, amazing success. I felt better than I'd ever felt in almost all of my life that I could remember for sure. And I got up from the sofa early one morning, um, had about a half a cup of coffee in me and I fell over on my wife. I, we were sitting there drinking our coffee. Like we always do getting ready for, for work. And 
I fell over on her and she said, I'll quit being a joke star. I said, I'm not joking. Something's wrong. And I walked behind her and she heard, and that was the sound of my body striking a ceramic floor. And she said, what was that? I said, I don't know, but I can't move. So she basically long, long story short, she got me to the hospital when I was refusing to go like most men do. And I can say that with absolute sincerity because I'm a guy and no doctor needs to touch me. I know what's wrong with me. I've just got food poisoning. Doctor comes in about an hour and a half after admitting me and says, you've either had a stroke or you have a brain tumor. I was convinced I had a brain tumor. And I thought, okay, I'm picturing myself bald, a scar on my head. I have no idea where this is. Um, I'm probably going to die. That's really what went through my head. Right when he said that, I'm looking him in the eyes and I'm thinking I'm going to die. So he leaves the room. Wife was not in the room. She comes back in and just as I'm about to break it to her, he stops her and says, oh, your husband, he's either had a stroke or he's got a brain tumor. Thanks, Doc, for that wonderful bedside mm -hmm. manner. Mm -hmm. um, no offense to Indian doctors, but you guys are like engineers in the brain. You don't know bedside manner very well, generally. So I'm kind of thankful for it, though, because my wife is a science teacher and she is very firmly rooted in biology. And she understood when he said that, OK, we're dealing with something serious. This isn't sepsis. Everybody thought that it might be sepsis. He comes running back into the room and he said, we're going to get you in for more contrast MRI and we're going to find out what's wrong with you. That afternoon, my wife said, cut it to me straight. He takes her out of the room, says to her, we're going to break protocol. You get to sleep in the bed with him tonight because he's not going to wake up in the morning. Now, I, matter of fact is pretty honest when it's necessary mm -hmm. and she needed that. And um, she came in and she told me, hey, uh, God's on our side. We're not going to let this beat us. Um, but the doctor doesn't think you're going to wake up in the morning, but we'll prove him wrong. So pumped full of morphine, I went to bed and I woke up the next morning and much to my doctor's surprise, I was alive and well. And he stood over my bed with three other doctors, everybody in their lab coats and everybody's got their little notebook in their writing. And he said, what do you know about a stroke? I said, you told me I had one. He said, okay. One in four strokes, well, there's a stroke in America every four minutes. One in four of those is fatal. The one you had, it's called a brainstem stroke. We don't know why you're here. And I said, well, oh, wow. okay, well, I know why I'm here. I'm here because God needs me here, right? And he said, okay. Now, I know I'm talking to somebody who's likely Hindu, just as a guess. And he said, well, beyond that, what do you eat? I said, I'm a carnivore explain yourself <laughs> and i said i don't eat plants i'm on a plant-free diet and he said how do you get your vitamins and i said i get my vitamins from my beef that i eat and i'm sorry i understand that you're a hindu likely he said yes i said you probably worship cows he said yes i said i eat cows no offense i understand your religion but i eat them and he said you don't eat vegetables at all i said i don't eat any vegetables at all he said that's impossible. I said, I thought I was supposed to die from the brainstem stroke. And he said, okay, you got me. We don't know what's going on and we'd sure like to know. So we talked a little bit longer and then he tried to convince me that I should really be on a plant-based diet. And I told him I will never be on a plant-based diet again. And I've tried it. I was a vegetarian at one time. It wasn't for me. So uh, six days later, I'm discharged from a hospital on the sixth floor, the stroke wing before COVID. Mm -hmm. I have never had a jab. I do not believe in that. And this was before COVID even hit. It was December of 2019. It was something everywhere else in the world, but it was nothing in America yet. Mm -hmm. So not to diminish that, that whatever was behind C-19 they're going to call it that. Okay, let's call it that. Let's call it what they want to call it. People were sick mm -hmm. and I wasn't, but I survived what should have killed me. So stepping forward about a month and a half, my wife was really upset with me for, for sticking with carnivore. And I'd even messaged Dr. Baker from the bed 
Dr. Sean Baker, you probably know mm -hmm. who he is. Mm -hmm. I messaged him from my bed through Instagram and he responded and he said, I've never met a brain stem struck survivor. This is very rare. It was your carnivore lifestyle that saved you. And I tried to convince my wife of that and she just wouldn't hear of it because there's so much noise in the world about what you're supposed to eat, veganism, vegetarianism, pescatarianism, selectitarianism, call it what you want. But I was eating processed foods. I was eating seed oils. I was eating sugar. But mind you that at the time I had no inclination to stay away from things like seed oils. So I would eat chicken wings. I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. I just didn't do that much research, but I knew what I was doing felt really good. So by March of 2020, my mother passed away and I am man enough to admit that depression got the best of me. And I held her hand when she breathed her last breath and it was tough to do. And my stepfather is, was a bourbon aficionado. And he taught me everything there was to know about bourbon. Mm -hmm. And we sat and we drank great bottles of bourbon. And when I used to eat at a place, we have a place called Wendy's and I used to eat at Wendy's, but I would eat just the burger patty and cheese, but nothing else. Eventually that turned into the whole burger with a bun. Then it comes with fries and those fries are pretty spectacular. And it also, there's an option to get a frosty. One thing led to another. And the next thing I know, I was back up to 200 and maybe 220 pounds, 230. And I was down from 254. So 254 to 175, that was a big deal. And then I gained it all back because I went straight back down the carb hole. And as, the let's see, it was, <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to remember which doctor it was. I want to say it was Dr. Westman who refers to the carb river. And so mm -hmm. I fell on the river of carbs and there I was again. And the worst thing was the alcohol. The second worst thing was the, the buns and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. um, as COVID started to take its grip on America, things were shutting down and I suggested to my wife, it's time to buy an RV. It's time to go hit the road because if I don't, I'm going to end up a dead man because I'm eating bad again. And I really want to enjoy the world as much as I can in this little world around us. And she said, okay, let's do it. Sold the house, moved into an RV, traveled the country for a year and two months. Day drinking was the, the thing to do. Nine o'clock in the morning, somebody standing at, the, at my door, knocking on it with a bottle of Tito's in one hand and zing zang in the other. I had the celery. I had the bacon strips. Let's have fantastic Bloody Marys. So we did. Then 12 o'clock in the pool, because we're staying in resorts. 12 o'clock in a pool, we're drinking Michelob Ultras and champagne. And at five or six o'clock at night, we're making dinner, usually burgers, hot dogs, whatever. And then we're throwing down um, New Amsterdam pineapple vodka and Sprite. Next thing you know, fat boy got mm -hmm. back up to 250. And August of last year, I think I'd lost, well, I guess starting in about June of last year, I started losing the weight again. I went back to being a carnivore, felt great. August, we went to the Keto Summit in Orlando. I finally got to meet Dr. Barry. By then, I knew exactly who he was. I mm -hmm. finally got to meet him. I got to meet a lot of great people, much to my surprise. One of my early on heroes was Dave Feldman, who is the author of some fantastic cholesterol studies. He was sitting in the room literally 20 feet behind me. And I went, what? Because they called him by name. And I turned around, you've got to be kidding me. He's <laughs> here. And there he was. So it was kind of cool. Um, I got to meet uh, Abby Durlewanger, the House of Keto. I got to hear some phenomenal stories from so many people. And afterwards, I met Ken Berry. And I told him that I had this really weird concept that I might need to do this thing with my RV. So I did. Mm -hmm. um, we left that conference. He said, hey, man, that sounds great. You ought to do it. I did it. And uh, fast way forward. Um, mm -hmm. January of 2023, I unveiled Brisket, the RV, which <laughs> is wrapped like the butcher paper and or butcher man. And, yeah. uh, and I did that for a reason because there's so, there's so much misinformation in society 
about what you should eat and everybody's trying to sell something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, honestly, even if we go all the way back to the, to the early days of low carb, most people recognize the term Atkins diet and Atkins was right on. And so many people tried to poo poo him because he really started, Dr. Atkins started a trend of people going, Hey, wait a minute, maybe sugar's not good for me. And maybe fat's not so bad, but it wasn't a high fat diet. He just spoke to more protein. Mm -hmm. And you can also go backwards eating too much protein and not enough fat. Your, your liver can actually, you know, the, you know, the, the, the routine. So that went away. They tried to paint him as a bad guy and that he even died for, I I forget what, what the story is, but it's an ending to a story that most people want to hear because most people are not willing to give up their sugar. Most people don't want to give up their carbs. Most right. people don't want to give up a Dorito, uh, a p- slice of pizza. Um, the They love steak, but they've got to have that baked potato next to it. Mm-hmm. And they certainly didn't want to give up their salads because that had their ranch dressing all over it. And that was healthy, right? <laughs> <laughs> but there's seed oils and sugar right. and processed crud. And so, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Brain injury right back there. <laughs> this happens to me. I'm sorry. So as the, the movement started to make its way, and Dr. Ken Berry tells a fantastic story about how he used to give people the advice that you eat more, eat less, move more. Well, that's like saying load your car down with an extra 2,000 pounds, run it at red line at the fastest you can, but get better gas mileage. It's mm-hmm. impossible. You just can't do it. So that's where I really started paying closer attention to seed oils, um, definitely cutting out more carbs. And I thought, well, there's no way I can do this and step out of this RV and be overweight. Because of course people are going to say, well, yeah, no wonder you're a fat. So all you eat is meat, right? Doesn't that feed into the narrative? Yeah. So exactly. The real truth is brisket is my accountability partner. I love that. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, so you, from what I understand, I, I had one more question. I have two more sure. questions. Um, you drive around like trailer, not trailer park. Uh, what is it called? RV parks. RV parks, resorts, RV parks, Those resorts, things. campgrounds. Yeah. And okay. trailer parks. <laughs> and trailer parks. Okay. And you like promote the carnivore lifestyle. I do. Okay. I do. <laughs> and if you, are you able to put pictures to this video when we're yeah. done? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to send you some photos of yeah. the back of the RV Okay. because I know I'm going to start a fight with a lot of people because the back of the RV and it's literally right over my shoulder, right here. Right yeah. Um, this is the back window of the RV. Okay. Literally it says promoting farmers, not farmers. And the spelling is farmers with an F and farmers PH. Oh, okay. And, and that really resonates that. with a lot of people because they understand what I'm doing. When they see that, they go, oh, I get yeah. it. There's QR codes on the vehicle so that if we're under speed on the highway, which is the whole reason why this is here, I'm a rolling billboard for the idea. Yeah. They scan that QR code at 60 miles an hour and they bring up my website and now they can get information and they never have to talk to me. Then I get an email from people saying, hey, I just passed you on the interstate and what a great idea. And I love this. I want to learn more. So I'm going to read all of your stories and I want to watch these videos. I want to know more. That's the whole point to this project. And that's what I see this as. I feel like this is a calling. Yeah, I'm sure. I understand why. (laughs) (laughs) I understand why. Um, So did you see that video from Dr. Berg today? Where he has that piece of tape over his mouth. This morning I was drinking my cup of coffee and I turned on my morning uh, internet feed and I was looking at my YouTube channel and Dr. Berg video popped up and I see this tape and I went, that's interesting. And I clicked it. It almost caused me to break into tears because the reality is really setting in. That man has 11 million plus followers on YouTube. Right. He is he is so tuned in to the keto lifestyle and he's mostly well 
he's not strict carnivore. He's not strict um, keto. He's not strict ketovore, but he's also completely strict against processed foods, against mm -hmm. seed oils, against vegetable oils, against fake foods. He's against the big industrial pharma and big industrial food narratives. And so when I saw this, it hurt my feelings to know that the number one media pushing machine in the world is Google and they own YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I'm worried to death that as this starts to grow, it's going to become even worse for all of the followers or for all of the, the influencers. And I consider myself first and foremost, and this is the exact words I told to Dr. Barry. I am an influencer for the influencers. I'm a nobody. I'm mm -hmm. just a guy retired driving around the country as best I can in an RV. But I'm trying to get a message out to people to see these people. When they ask me, what should I do? I say, go watch Dr. Barry on Monday Night Live with his wife, Nisha, and mute the freaking channel. Just mute it. Don't listen to a word he says. Because even though his words are vitally important, don't listen to him. Expand the chat window and read people's words. Mm -hmm. Hundreds and thousands of people every single Monday night are commenting and you see it scroll up the screen. Cured my IBS, cured my diabetes, cured my Parkinson's, curing my MS. I mean, these are real anecdotal stories from America, from people in South America, from people mm -hmm. in China, from people all over the world who are getting to tune into that. They're waking up. And so now there's a huge effort to stifle that. Well, I have a saying, you can't cancel me. Mm -hmm. Sure, you can cancel every one of my social media projects, whether I'm on Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, or X. It doesn't matter. If I'm on a video screen, you can cancel that. AI, the robots, they can cancel that. But AI is not sitting in a car behind me or in an 18 wheeler behind me reading this and going, what in the world? And then mm -hmm. seeing my website and then they can cancel my website. They can just shut down whoever is my host. OK, go for it. Shut that down. You better show up at a campground to shut me up because that's the only way you're going to do it. Run me off the road. Kill me. That's the only way you're going to stop me because I got a mouth. I have knowledge. I have a heart and I want to help. That's awesome. That's wonderful. Yeah, exactly. We need more people like you. Well, and I think you're doing a phenomenal job of that. Oh, thank you. And I you. think everyone who is tapped into the notion of spreading the word, I think they're all doing something powerful. And honestly, there's a lot of people that are stuck in the keto space, mm -hmm. but they're eating keto trash. And I'm not going to name any names that and I'm not going to name, <laughs> I'm not going to name names of particular companies, but I can tell you this without the label keto, yeah. most people don't have an income stream. So if they create something in the food market, they brand it keto, even though it's got carbs, even though it's mm -hmm. got processed items, even though it's got seed oils, they're calling it keto and right. getting away with it and people are buying it. Here's what I like to tell people. If your goal is to lose weight, then carnivore is really the only answer. Because if you think going keto is an answer, then you're going to find yourself buying keto desserts, mm -hmm. keto bread, keto pizza. All those things are bad for you. Right. I say, if you want to just be a vegan and stick to eating vegetables, knock yourself out. If you want to be a vegetarian, more power to you. If you want to be a carnivore, great. But here's the thing. Don't color outside those lines. Mm -hmm. When you do, you're coloring outside those lines in search of a sweet. And when right. you get that sweet, you're killing your body. And then there's going to be a seed oil attached to it somewhere. And that's mm -hmm. not going to do you any favors. So before you know it, you're really not doing anything. You're just telling yourself, oh, I'm eating something that says it's keto. But yet they're still 20, 30, 40 pounds overweight. Right. And I hate to see that. So 
I'm not going to say his name, but there's a gentleman at the campground where I am. I'm currently up in North Georgia in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it is phenomenal. (laughs) And I'm loving every second, and I'm avoiding hurricane season in Florida. That's why I come up here. I just go out of Florida, and I get away from the hurricanes. And there's a gentleman here who is 71 years old. I won't say his name. I won't say where he's from. And he said to me today, I'm a type 2 diabetic. And I accidentally gave myself the big shot twice this morning, and I started going to a diabetic coma. And you would think that after all these years of doing this, I'd be smart enough to remember the short shot in the morning, the long shot in the afternoon. I'd, I'm not a diabetic, so I don't know what a short and a long is. All I know is that he almost overdosed on insulin. Mm. And I said, you know, I'll call him John Doe. So John Doe, there's always a reason for for me meeting people. And we don't know what it is right up front. But I'm going to say this and stop me if I sound preachy. But I know people and I can point you to dozens upon dozens upon dozens of cases of people, not doctors telling you, but the actual person telling you that they were in your shoes at your age and they kicked diabetes to the curb. And it's possible. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a professional. I can point you in the direction of the people who you can listen to. They're not doctors either. They're survivors. They're thrivers because of what you see on the side of my RV. And to make it really simple, I'm not saying all you eat is meat. I'm saying don't eat sugar. Don't eat carbs. Same thing. Don't eat processed foods. Don't eat seed oils. What does that leave you? Meat, animal fats and animal proteins, eggs. Okay, cheese, be careful of how it's processed. Raw dairy, better for you than not, uh, or better for you than than not raw dairy. But I'm not going to be that guy that tells somebody, do this and don't do that and don't do that and don't do that and don't do that. Because Mm -hmm. if you, the, the one do this is canceled out by the four don'ts. And all they hear is, I can't have my donut. I can't drink my Diet Coke. And so I told him, really what it comes down to is it's what you don't eat. And what that leaves behind are the things that you will thrive on. And it's the things that that really work in our bodies because we're animals. Your brain is 60 to 65% fat. That's animal fat because we're an animal, right? <laughs> Why are we eating plants? We're not made of plants. They don't mm-hmm. provide that necessary brain fat that we need. Sugar depletes our brain energy. Sugar breaks down the neurons in our brains. So I just try to let people know, like John Doe, you can stop this, but that's up to you right here. You know this. I don't have to tell you. You don't need to go to a, a shrink to tell you what's wrong. You know what's wrong. You just need to hear it from somebody else to be sure and to validate what you know is true. And then you prove it to yourself. But if you want to keep taking meds, that's up to you. If you want to keep accidentally taking the wrong diabetic shot and not be able to go ride your motorcycle across the Blue Ridge Parkway mountain, that's your choice. But we're not getting older. We're getting sicker. And you can stop that. You can stop the one thing. You can't stop getting older, but you certainly can stop getting sicker. That's beautiful. How did he take that? Very well. He said, Greg, I can't wait to hear what I'm supposed to buy. I said, brother, I'm going to show you how you can spend $100 in the grocery store, walk out with a couple of very heavy bags of meat, and be satiated for over eight days. It's easy to do. Just look at the simple things that you're going to buy. And it's what you're not buying. You're not throwing away produce. We all buy a head of lettuce or we buy Mm -hmm. some veggies thinking we're going to do better. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I'm going to eat a salad. But you throw it away because it went rotten because you ended up stuffing yourself with Doritos. Right. Or keto ice cream, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yes. So it's a, it, it is, um, it's a challenge. And I operate on, and this is what Dr. Boz and I talked about. And she, she actually coined this. She said, Greg, you are a megaphone for what we're doing. And I hope yeah. so. And she said, we, we were having a conversation about, um, gosh, I just got sidetracked again. 
we were talking about willpower. We were talking about people wanting to make the change and they have to find that desire in their heart. And we mm -hmm. can't force anybody to do it. And so right. we operate on what's called a red light, yellow light, green light, red light. If somebody throws up that red light, you don't go forward. You just say, Hey, have a nice day. The red light comes when someone says, well, I can't give up my beer. I can't give up my ice cream. You can't take away my Takis. I like to eat at Portillo's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoy your life. If they stick around and they put their ear while their wife's asking questions, I see that, but I'm not talking to them any longer. I'm talking right. to the wife who wants to know more. Mm -hmm. And then if he starts to come back in, that becomes a yellow light. If he asks a question, all right, yellow light. And then I stop that guy and I say, okay, I'm not going to say another word to you unless you want to hear straight talk, because that's what I'm going to give you. Mm -hmm. I don't sugarcoat anything. Okay. Or no, I'm good. I'm happy where I'm at. Knock yourself out. Yeah. Exactly. It's not my job. It's just an opportunity to help people. Mm -hmm. I love that. Great. Well, it's about half an hour. At this yeah. point, and um, I know we didn't have so much time tonight, but do you want to say anything else before we uh, end our little discussion? Yes, I do. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, okay. one of the one of the serious side effects to a brainstem stroke is that I lost all of my sense of body temperature control. So I can sweat in a cold room. Mm -hmm. I can burn up in a 60 degree refrigerator. So it's it's very unnerving but I couldn't feel the left half of my body. It was mm -hmm. like I was wrapped in thick jeans or canvas or leather. I considered oh, wow. myself to be leather skin from here over. And it was really odd because I could climb into the ocean in Florida where I'm from and it might be February and the water I know is 55, 60 degrees. I can't feel it on my left side. My right leg, I could feel the cold. My left, couldn't feel it at all. I could literally hold a lighter right here underneath my arm and burn my arm and I could smell my skin. I could smell my arm hairs burning. Couldn't feel a thing. It was the weirdest sensation. And that's so unnerving because among all the other things that go with a stroke, that is just something that just, it, it, it nips at you. It's like gnats mm -hmm. all over your face. Mm -hmm. And I never could find a drug to fix that. Gabapentin, I mean, they threw everything at me. I spent thousands of dollars on prescription medications trying to fix this. Nothing fixed it. I even tried medical marijuana. That didn't fix it. Nothing. Then I decided, oh, I was talking to my friends, Buzz and Bruce. Hi, Buzz. Hi, Bruce. They're my best friends in the whole wide world. They live up in Flagler Beach, just north of me. They became carnivores when I was a carnivore. And four years later, they are thriving. Oh, my God. I wish you could interview these guys. They're amazing. Mm -hmm. Bruce said to me one day about a month and a half ago, he said, you should try exogenous ketones. And I said, tell me more. I know what they are, but I don't know what they might do. He said, they might help you with your, your body numbness. Okay. What's it going to hurt? So I picked up my phone and he said, I said, what do I buy? He said, just just something that's got high reviews. So I brought up <laughs> exogenous ketones in Amazon and what pops up Dr. Boz exogenous VHB uh, ketones. I went, well, I love Dr. Boz. He's a friend. I'm going to support her click and bought him. I had him in a few days. I don't know the date now, but it was in August. I was up in Tennessee. It was about three weeks ago from now. And I had been taking the ketones for about seven or eight days. And I'm sitting in a, in a conference on that Saturday, listening to Dr. Westman talk. And a lady was sitting next to me and she was wearing a heavy coat because it was cold in the room. And one of her zippers brushed up against my arm, against my left arm. And I felt it. It wasn't just pressure. I felt the scratch of it. And she apologized. Oh, wow. I'm like, no, 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 Don't worry. You're fine. You're fine. Because <laughs> I snatched my arm back like, oh, my gosh. I wasn't paying attention. I was writing something and yeah. I shot back and I went, are you kidding me? I just felt my skin and I did this and I almost broke out in tears in the conference room. And I said, no, sure. hold it together, hold it together. You got to figure out why this is what just happened in your life. Mm -hmm. It was later that I realized 
I was taking her ketones. All of a sudden, I can feel my skin. Leather skin is gone. I could wow. feel cold temperature. I take a cold shower every single morning. The first minute to two minutes is cold. Mm -hmm. I climb in the shower. I turn on the cold water. I get that really quick flinch. I hold it. I turn around. I wash my hair. Then I reach over and turn on the hot water. And then it slowly comes on. Now, when I take that cold shower, I feel it on all parts of my body. I feel it on both sides of my head. I feel it all the way down my back on the left side. It was unbelievable. I was so excited. I texted Dr. Boz and said, you're not going to believe this. She said, I do believe it. Hmm. That's what ketones do. Well, I had a really long conversation with Dr. Westman. I had some conversation with Dr. Barry, but the long conversation with Dr. Westman was how many people are coming out of massive catastrophic illnesses or near death. And they were strong in ketones when it happened. And those strong ketones, we believe, are what are, is what's saving us. Wow. And so he wants me to put together a Facebook group of people who have survived these types of incidents, especially strokes, with a ketogenic lifestyle. And I'm not talking about a ketogenic lifestyle where somebody is eating all the ketogenic desserts and the horrible shakes and all the things that right. are full of all the processed stuff. I'm talking about people who say, you know what, I'm going to eat a little bit of greens, but I know that I can't have anything more than maybe olive oil and, and, and vinegar. Um, people who are serious in keto, but not, not keto carby. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I need to yeah. find those people. And I said, doc, I don't know that I can find all those people. He said, give it a try. See what <laughs> you come up with. The next day I met a man, 73 years old was dead for an hour and a half in his RV while his wife was doing chest compressions for a half an hour. They were oh in God. rural Hazard County, Kentucky. This is the most amazing story. He was 72. They live full-time in an RV and travel the country. Such a sweet, wonderful couple. I'll leave them nameless because they don't like the limelight. Okay. And I'll call him John Doe number two. <laughs> John Doe fell over on the sofa. Can we push past 35 minutes? Are we okay? We're good. If you're good, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> okay. So he falls over on the sofa. There were two years carnivore. He falls over on the sofa. She reaches up and pulls his glasses off so he doesn't break them. He falls down and she looks at him and she realizes his chest isn't moving. I think my husband just died. She threw the glasses down, feels his pulse, no pulse. He's starting to turn purple. So the only thing she knows to do is I think I have to help him start breathing. So there she is. Got him on the floor and she's doing chest compressions. Stops to get her phone, dials 911. Help, my husband's dying. I'm doing chest compressions. I can't do this by myself. So they rush out with the medics 30 minutes away. So for 30 minutes, she's doing chest compressions. He's not breathing. Mm -hmm. Only her chest or only her mm -hmm. compressions and he's breathing. He's non-responsive. Half an hour later, the medics show up. They start doing chest compressions for the next half an hour, and then they get him in the ambulance and they race him back to Hazard County's hospital. And that's an hour and a half that they've been doing this. Okay. They go in, they innovate him, they force him into a coma. They tell her, call in the family because when he comes out of this induced coma, when we pull the, the, um, the innovation tube out, which is apparently a very long process. Once we pull that out, there's no chance of him having brain activity because his brain was dead for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. So don't expect the best, expect the absolute worst. He will probably be brain dead at that point. So she called in the family and I can't recall the exact details, but five days later, when they went to remove the, the, the innovation tube, when they, the, the airway, when they went to bring it out, he woke up, made a joke, and then he fell back asleep. Oh, and wow. she went, my husband is making jokes. And <laughs> I can't remember what the joke was he said, but even I laughed out loud. And the next day he woke up and he was as normal as I am right now talking to you. Wow, that's incredible. And he was dead for an hour and a half. That's I mean, incredible. dead's dead. Dead. He didn't see the other side, just like me. I didn't see the other side. I didn't see a bright light. Right. I didn't see that, but it was completely pitch black. 
I've never seen so much dark in my life. He said the same thing. It was pitch black to him. But he was never called into the light because he knew, I'm not dying. I'm going to be around. I kind of knew the same thing. I heard everything going on around me, but I wasn't going to die. I just, Mm -hmm. nobody was calling me back. So I was good. And so we talked about this and it, that was the second realization in two days of the power of ketones. And Mm -hmm. so here is this man who survived death. Um, He had a valve stop in his heart. And so now he wears a pacemaker. So it has to be there, but he's back to hardcore carnivore and not changing a thing. And today he's 73 years old and he and his wife still travel the country doing the exact same thing. She is also hardcore carnivore. And when I say hardcore carnivore, what I'm trying to say is as close to zero carbs as we can possibly get. That's Mm -hmm. really what hardcore means. And to a lot of people that's foreign to a guy who survived a a near death experience. I'm fine with going zero carb because I know what it means for me. Right. Right. I might be getting older, but I'm not going to get sicker. Great. That's awesome. So I think what I want to leave the audience with is understand the therapeutic side of what being in heavy ketosis is. I actually checked my levels. Thank you. Keto mojo. Um, You guys are fantastic. I just checked it and I am running at what they consider to be a moderate level of ketosis therapeutic level is when you're at stage, I'm in stage three, stage two, according to their numbers is therapeutic and stage one is the highest you can be really be to be stage one. I have to be over a 2.5 on my glucose or I'm sorry, on my um, ketones. And I have to be under 80 on my blood sugar. And then I'll reach that, that one I'm headed back there. I just did a 72 hour fast. That's three days. I could have pushed beyond that, but I didn't. I wanted to stop because I think maybe two or three times a year, somebody can probably get away with that long of a fast. Mm -hmm. Don't do it every week. Certainly don't do it monthly, but maybe every other month you might be able to get away with it and then intermittent fast. So that's where I am. I'm back to doing that because I had to break a plateau. I got stuck at 200 and that's because I started eating keto junk and I started building that sweet tooth again. And I knew. Mm -hmm. This is going to end badly. And right. if ketones worked so well before, I'm going to kick them into high gear now and really get the benefit out of them. So what okay. I want to leave everybody with is keto means ketosis or ketones. Ketones are produced from ketosis. That's a better way of understanding the best fuel for your body next to the carbs that you let your, your liver and your, your, your gallbladder and your bile make. The next best source of energy is ketones and ketones are healing. So if you're suffering from mental issues, brain fog, ALS, MS, any, any brain malformity, it might be Parkinson's, whatever that is. The one thing you may have never tried was going into a therapeutic state of ketosis and see what that can do for you. I'm walking proof. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I love it. Oh, you're welcome. (laughs) Do you you have any more questions? I don't have any more questions for tonight, but I'm sure we can, we can talk again. And I would love to talk again. Oh, uh, yes, please send me, I will put all of your, your website and your Twitter and everything below, um, in the description so people can reach out to you. Awesome. 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 All right. And of course, (laughs) and anybody who sees me on the road and you see me wave, let me know that you saw this video with Alia. <laughs> awesome. And I will wave whenever I go back to the U.S. I will find your RV. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.